Hi and welcome to the second lecture of phonology this week. So just to give you a recap on where we ended last video, um, we were talking about syllables and syllabification and we talked about the syllabification algorithm that actually syllabifies syllables into onsets, nucleus and coda and we were talking about phonotactic constraints that actually operate over these syllabification. What we are going to do this um, lecture is we are going to look at an important distinction between sound as produced by the speaker and sound as represented in the speaker's memory. So just as an illustration of what I mean by actually uh, memory versus uh, pronunciation. So if you look at the word table in English, uh, in IPA, it is represented uh, as I have written there uh, in IPA. And so this is without any syllabification, you don't see any dots, you don't see any syllable symbol. And we also don't talk about um, aspiration, which is a phenomenon that I will introduce to you in a minute. But when you actually pronounce this particular word, you actually pronounce it as table and not table. Uh, and this, um, at, the, at the beginning, this kind of um, half of air that you uh, hear at the beginning of the first syllable in t, like t, table, that is what we mean by aspiration. And so aspiration is a phenomenon in English that you can actually hear with voiceless plosives, voiceless stops of English. And so these are the sounds p, t, and k. So when p, t, and k come in the beginning of a word in the onset position, uh, the first speech sound of an onset position, you can actually hear uh, this extra puff of air, which is what we call as aspiration. And so when you pronounce it, you pronounce it with the aspiration and you also pronounce it with the syllabification because you kind of know where to uh, break down the word into beats and its natural rhythm. The analogy that I want to draw, and if you have been reading your textbook, you will actually, uh, you would have actually read about this analogy. Uh, the analogy that I want to draw uh, is with respect to uh, the small mammal called the stoat. As you can see, the stoat has a, a fur that is light brown in color, uh, but it also has like a white chest, um, a, a white lower body. And this guy is the stoat. Uh, during winter uh, and now you can see that his entire body is uh, white in color except for the black um, tail uh, tip but now when sto the stoat is actually entirely white in color uh, he is called an ermine and not a stoat and so that's the analogy that I want to draw your attention to the analogy that I want you to keep in mind with respect to uh, what we are going to talk about in phonology uh, this lecture, that you can have the stoat in two different variations, one as the stoat, which is all the time, and then ermine, which is the stoat in winter time, right? There are two different variations of stoat. It's one and the same animal, except that it has two different names and two different variations depending on the environment and the climate. The analogy in phonology with respect to the stoat and the ermine is that of a phoneme. So this is a new term that I haven't introduced to you before. A phoneme is a basic sound in the phonological system, right? So it is a speech sound, but it is also the basic sound in the phonological system. And the two different variations of the phoneme are called as allophones. So I've defined what an allophone is for you. The allophone is a variant of sound which appears in a certain predictable environment. Just like the ermine, uh, it, it appears in winter. Uh, that's what the allophone does do. It appears in a particular uh, phonological environment. So I have introduced to you phoneme and allophone. And so the, the analogy with respect to the phoneme and the allophone is that phoneme is the sound as represented in the speaker's memory and the allophone is a sound as actually produced by the speaker. And we will be using two different um, variations of this. So phoneme is always in a slanted uh, bracket and allophone is always going to be in square bracket just for um, differentiating a phoneme and an allophone. And so 
I'm going to illustrate this with uh, the phoneme, uh, the, al the alveolar voiceless phoneme T in English. And I'm going to show you that this particular phoneme has two different allophones, the T as well as the T with aspiration, right? So here is an example of how you can actually represent the phoneme and the allophones in English. So you can represent the phoneme with slanted uh, bracket as I have done here. So that's the T. And then there are two variations of this. This is the T in square bracket and then the T, which is the aspiration. So if you look at the environment in which you can in which you can see the aspiration, you can see that it can appear in the initial position of a word, that is the initial onset position of a word, or it can appear in a stressed syllable without a preceding consonant, as in the word hat. Um, but when when do you get the t without the aspiration? This is as in the second element of a consonant cluster, like in the word stand, because t is not the first element of the complex onset, S is the first element of the complex onset, and therefore you don't get an aspiration. You don't say stand, stand, you say stand. And that's the difference between uh, the two allophones of the phoneme D. Now, um, we have illustrated that the, um, the voiceless alveolar uh, phoneme T in English has two different allophones, but it doesn't have to be the case that uh, these two speech sounds are always allophones across languages. So whether or not two speech sounds are allophones of one phoneme are determined by language to language basis. So I'm going to show you an example of how these two speech sounds in Thai uh, are actually not allophones, but they are two different phonemes. Now, how do we actually know this? We actually know this when we look at Thai data, and I've given you two examples of uh, words from Thai. And so these are the words tam, which means to pound. It's the verb to pound, and then tam with the aspiration. And this means the verb to do. So now you can see that these two words exactly look the same, except for the aspiration uh, on the first uh, speed sound two. But you can see that these two words actually mean two different things, right? So when you get a meaning change, when you get the same form for both the words, except the meaning changes with just that aspiration added in, that is when you actually know that it is the phoneme that's actually distinguishing the meaning because the nucleus and the coda remain the same across the two words. So here is the logic that I have used to arrive at the fact that um, the aspirated t and the non-aspirated t are two different phonemes, right? Uh, and not allophones of a single phoneme. It's because if you had a rule stating that um, you would get in front of the nucleus a and uh, the coda m, you will get uh, aspirated t you need to have another rule uh, that derives the uh, environment of where you would get the non-aspirated T um, in front of the A and the M. But the rule is exactly the same. And that is why you can conclude that, well, these are allophones of two different phonemes and not the same phoneme. When we talk about words like this in Thai, for example, where you have the same nucleus A and the same coda m, but the only difference is in the onset position with respect to the speech sound in the onset position, we call these kind of words as minimal pairs, right? So these kind of words in Thai uh, or in English where you have just one sound that is different among the two words, they are called as minimal pairs. So the general principle is that if there are minimal pairs for two uh, speech sounds, then they are allophones of different phonemes. So if you can find minimal pairs between speech sounds, yes, they are two different phonemes. So here are some examples to drive home the point. Uh, so these are minimal pairs for the two liquids that we talked about earlier. This is your lateral L and your retroflex uh, R in English. And so here I've given you some examples in IPA uh, for a minimal pair. And again, just a note that 
to identify minimal pairs, you always have to uh, transcribe words into their IPA. So we are not talking about minimal pairs in spelling. Again, we do not care about spelling uh, in this class. We only care about the production and the pronunciation of the word. So you can see that wrap and lap are minimal pairs in English because you have the same nucleus or the same coda, but the onset is different. Right, the same thing with rip and lip, and you see that these are minimal pairs because they also distinguish meaning. You get two different meanings uh, with, when you change the onset position. And then with peer and peel, you can see that you get the difference in the coda position, the R and the LERS in the coda position, and that's again changing the meaning of the word. Here are some other examples for sip and sh in English. So sip and ship are minimal pairs because the only difference is in the onset position. Mess and mesh are minimal pairs because the only difference is in the coda position. And then last and lashed uh, are, um, on, uh, they are also minimal pairs with the difference being in the complex coda, in the first position of the complex coda, right? We are going to uh, do a lot more exercises in the phonology lab section. So you will get practice with respect to identifying minimal pairs and coming up with minimal pairs of English. When we talk about allophones and phonemes uh, of English, we can actually talk about how uh, listening to two different phonemes, uh, you can actually hear the contrast between the two different speech sounds. So for example, when I tell you R, R versus L, L, you can actually hear the difference between these two phonemes, suggesting that contrast is perception, right? So if there are two minimal pairs, if there are minimal pairs for speech sounds, then you hear the distinction between these two speech sounds. For example, in Japanese, you don't have a distinction between R and L, which is why they actually, Japanese speakers actually don't hear words starting with R and words starting with L in English as two different words. So you would often hear them say light and right the same way just because they don't have a distinction between R and L in Japanese. But in English we do, that's why we hear the contrast. And so by corollary, we can say that if there is absolutely no contrast between speech sounds, then maybe speakers don't actually necessarily perceive the difference between these two speech sounds, right? So if two speech sounds are allophones of different phonemes, then maybe they are in contrastive. Um, maybe you can hear the contrast between them. And then if X and Y are two different, uh, they're allophones of the same phoneme, then you don't hear the contrast, which is why it's very difficult for English speakers to actually hear the contrast between the aspirated T and the non-aspirated T because it's not something which is phonemic, it is something which is allophonic. And so to hear the contrast between allophones is much more difficult than to hear the contrast between two different phonemes. When two speech sounds are not in contrastive uh, um, distribution, we say that they are in complementary distribution with each other, right? So here is the illustration from T and the aspirated variety in English. We said that they are allophones to the same phoneme, which we wrote with the slanted bracket T. Now that means that you can actually write a rule that states whether you say T or T, right? And you cannot uh, write the same rule for both of them, right? Because we already established the environment, the phonological environment in which you can get the aspirated variety versus the non-aspirated variety. You get the aspirated variety T, if you uh, if the the speech sound is in the initial position of the onset of that particular word, but you get the non-aspirated variety if it is the second uh, speech sound in a complex onset or it is at the end of the word, right in the coda position. So this is what we mean by complementary distribution. That is, if two speech sounds are allophones of the same phoneme, then they are in complementary distribution, which means that when you get one you don't get the other one, and vice versa, right? So here is the summary to find out um, minimal pairs uh, or lack of minimal pairs for two speech sounds. 
for any two speed sounds X and Y, we can find, if you can find minimal pairs, then we can conclude that these are allophones of different phonemes, right? So if there are minimal pairs, then they are two different phonemes. If they are minimal, if there are minimal pairs and they are allophones of two different phonemes, they are two different phonemes themselves, then they are said to be contrastive in language. And therefore, you can perceive the distinction between these two speech sounds. On the other hand, if you cannot find minimal pairs between X and Y, if you cannot find minimal pairs between two speech sounds X and Y, then they are in complementary distribution and they are allophones of the same phoneme and therefore speakers actually cannot perceive the distinction between the same speech sounds. This might sound a little bit confusing to you and it is one of the most difficult concepts that I have found my students struggling with um, in, in the entire semester. So I do have a handout uh, that I will be posting on Blackboard uh, that will actually walk you through this logic uh, that will uh, give you a better understanding of what a phoneme and an allophone is. But as I always say, when you solve a problem, when you do a problem in the phonology lab section, when you do a problem in your assignment, then it's going to be a lot more clearer to you. Because again, as a reminder, I'm not going to ask you in the midterm, what is an allophone? What's a phoneme? What's complementary distribution? What I expect you to know is understand the logic of how we find uh, contrastive distribution, how we find minimal pairs and allophones in the language, and how do you actually apply that to a real case scenario. That's what I'm interested in. So to make your life simpler, I have given you an algorithm uh, for problem solving in phonology. What we actually do is, the first thing that I want you to do is, I want you to find out if there are minimal pairs in the language. How do you find out whether there are minimal pairs in the language? You transcribe the word into IPA, you look at the syllable, you look at the onset, you look, look at the nucleus, and you look at a coda, and there should only be one minimal difference between the words, right? That is, nucleus and the coda remain the same, the onset changes. The onset and the coda remain the same, the nucleus changes. Or the, the um, coda remains the same, uh, and the onset changes, right? So only one minimal change between two words. That's how you find minimal pairs. If there are minimal pairs, then you ask the question, do they have different meanings? And then you say yes, and then you say minimal pair, two phonemes, problem solved. You don't have to worry about the right-hand side where you say yes to minimal pairs and they don't have different meanings, free variation. We won't be concerned with free variation at the introductory level. That's a little bit more advanced phonology. I don't want you to worry about that for this class. Uh, then you go back to the top of the algorithm. You ask the question, are there minimal pairs? And then you say no. Then that means that this is complementary distribution. And yes, you determine what the distribution is. That is, you write a phonological rule uh, for that distribution. And if you say, well, it's complementary distribution, is a complementary distribution and you say no, that means you've done the problem wrong and you start all over again from the top. So remember this algorithm. This is going to be crucial for you, uh, for your assignment, as well as for your uh, midterm. So to summarize what we have talked about in this lecture, um, we can talk about two different things, uh, the phoneme and the allophone. And the phoneme is a sound as represented in the speaker's memory and an allophone is a sound as it is actually produced by the speaker. We talked about data from both Thai and English, and we saw that languages can actually differ according to the way in which they divide the pi with respect to allophones and phonemes. So in Thai, for example, you can have the aspirated t and the non-aspirated t as allophones of different phonemes, but in English, for example, uh, there are no minimal pairs because the meaning does not change and therefore these are actually allophones of the same phoneme. So now we are ready to address what the phonological rules are. And I uh, kind of alluded to this when we were talking about phonetics that certain classes of sounds with respect to your international phonetic alphabet can actually behave in similar ways. So here are some examples of natural classes. 
So pertaka is a natural pertaka and berdaka are the natural class of oral stops in English, right? It's an entire natural class because this is an exhaustive list of oral stops, okay? Um, and I say oral stops because obviously there are nasal stops, manna and nga, but we're not adding that here. And that's why it's oral stops, right? Um, if I say pertaka and berdaka are the natural class of stops, that wouldn't be correct because it's not a natural class because you have three members that are not part of the class. Uh, and so if I ask you what's the natural class of, say, pertaka, you can say that they are the natural class of voiceless plosives, right, with the addition of the glottal stop as well, the question mark without the dot, right? So that is how you understand natural classes. They are things that behave the same way in certain phonological environment because they behave, they have a common feature uh, according to your international phonetic alphabet. Here is another example. So these are the sounds s, z, 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 z. And this is called the natural class of sibilant or the hissing sounds. Again, these are the sounds that you will find the most in um, Harry Potter uh, particle sounds, for example, right? So this is the natural class of sibilant. That's how we understand natural classes. They are the set of sounds that can be described by the shared feature so as to include all those sounds or exclude uh, all the others, right? So once you have a good enough understanding of natural classes, we will be doing, I will be asking you to do uh, an exercise on natural classes at the end of your textbook, at the back page of your textbook, uh, chapter three, uh, during the lab section. Uh, so things will be a lot more clearer to you at that point. Um, once you understand a phoneme and an allophone, complementary distribution, contrastive distribution, minimal pair and natural classes, you're now ready to understand phonological rules. We discussed four rules of uh, phonology, uh, but only three of them are going to be relevant uh, for you. The first one is called as the rule of assimilation. And the rule of assimilation says that a sound becomes more similar to sounds in its surroundings. So here's an example of this. So this is going to be your first practice in looking at data from English. Uh, with respect to solving a phonology problem. So I've given you the in prefixation in English and I've given you some data. On the left hand side, you can see that the prefix is in and on the right hand side, you can see in the words that the prefix is im. So you have on the left hand side words like insufficient, intolerant, etc. And on the right hand side, impractical, impossible, etc. I want you to take a minute to go through the words on the left hand side and right hand side and I want you to answer this question. Are these two two different pre prefixes in English or are they one prefix that actually changes its, um, it, its form according to its environment? So I'll give you a minute to actually think about this data set. Okay, so some of you may have actually said that yes, there is a pattern with respect to uh, the onsets in the second syllable of the words in the right hand column, and they form a natural class, p, m, and p. This is the natural class of bilabials. And therefore, the, the prefix that we are talking about is only one. It's the in prefixation in English, which actually becomes an im because of the natural class that it combines with, right? So we can write this particular rule in rule format, and this looks a lot like a rule in mathematics and chemistry, etc. And um, I don't really want you to worry about writing the rule in this particular format. You can even just write it like I've given you in the second bullet point uh, in just English uh, terminology without any of the arrows and stuff like that. So this rule can be written in becomes im when it precedes a bilabial sound, when the, the prefix precedes the bilabial sound. So in plus the bilabial sound becomes im. That's how you actually read this rule of English.
The second phonological rule that is going to be important for you to solve phonological problems is called as deletion. And so deletion is a process by which sounds actually become omitted from words. And the example that I have has to do with stress and stressed syllables in English. Sometimes when, when you put stress on a particular syllable in English, you actually delete or shorten an unstressed syllable. So here is an example. I want you to consider this particular word. And I first want you to write this word in IPA because you know how to do that. And I want you to count the syllables. So I'll give you a minute to do that. And once you have done that, I actually want you to count the syllables and let me know how many syllables there are. Many of you would have actually said that there are four syllables to this particular word. Many of you would have transcribed it like this, laboratory, laboratory, right? And that has to do with the fact that the, the stress is on the fifth syllable and therefore you are shortening uh, your fifth syllable and combining it into laboratory, right? Some of you could also have in slow speech, you can also say laboratory, laboratory with like your stress on the second syllable and therefore you get five syllables instead of four. But very often in rapid speech, you actually delete the vowel between the b and the r, and then you get only four syllables in this particular word. The opposite of the phonological rule of deletion is insertion. And so this is when you actually insert a particular word or a speech sound to divide up a syllable. So I want you to consider the noun length, which as you know, is a derived word of English. It's derived from the adjective long. Um, and so you have a suffixation at the end of this particular word. The suffix is the th suffix. And when you actually suffix the th to long, you actually get this inserted um, speech sound k in order to for you to make the transition from the engma, the vila nasal, to the suffix th. So k is kind of like a transitional sound. Uh, that you insert. So it's a phonological rule of insertion to help you transition from um, the um, engma to the th, which is a fricative. So from the stop to the fricative, you insert a voiceless stop. That's the rule of phonological insertion. And the last uh, rule that I want to talk about is metathesis. We won't be talking about this a lot. We won't be using this in any of our data sets. Uh, if you are continuing to do history of English with me next semester, we will talk about um, this rule a lot more then. Uh, these are cases where in Old English and Middle English, um, there was a process of reversing the order of speech sounds. So historical examples are the words for bird and third. This used to be written as bread and thread uh, in Old English and Middle English. And then with the ruler metathesis, it became bird and third. But we won't be concerned with this in 315. To summarize what we have seen so far, uh, sounds can form natural classes. And these natural classes are words and speech sounds that actually behave together on the basis of some features. And we can also have phonological rules that operate over these sounds. We discuss four phonological rules. We discuss assimilation, insertion, deletion, and metathesis. Now, what we are going to do is in the lab section, we will be working towards problems of solving phonology. Uh, I will be um, solving a problem on the whiteboard uh, so that you can see how you can apply the logic that you have learned in this lecture to uh, understanding a lot more uh, about phonological rules and uh, phonological data.